Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, a health policy reporter and anchor of the Health 202 newsletter here at The Post. And I'm delighted to welcome my first guest this morning, Christy Turlington Burns. You know her as one of the most successful supermodels in American culture, but she's also founder of Every Mother Counts, which is a nonprofit that works to make pregnancy and childbirth safe for mothers everywhere. We're talking to Christy this morning about maternal mortality and the state of maternal health in the US, uh, especially amid the coronavirus pandemic. So excited to speak with you, Christy. I wanted to um, start out by asking you to share uh, a little bit of your own story uh, with us. We know that maternal health became very important to you about 16 years ago when you experienced your own complication. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I had a wonderful pregnancy and um, a great team to support my um, process in becoming a mother. Um, but after delivering my daughter 16 and a half years ago, um, I did not progress to the third stage of labor. Um, and that caused me to have a postpartum hemorrhage. Um, luckily for me, I was in a birth center um, within a hospital and the team that was helping me um, knew what to do and they worked together seamlessly to, um, to address and manage the complication and I was fine. But going home um, soon after and trying to understand what happened, um, the first place I went was what about all of the women who don't have access to this care. Um, and of course, I learned soon after that, that um, many, many women do not, and of course suffer um, either maternal mortality or um, severe morbidity as a result of that um, lack of access to care. Well, thank you. And to put some kind of perspective on this, so obviously there have been major gains in maternal health over the last hundred years. Um, and we hit a, a low, low point in the 1980s for maternal mortality. But ever since then, I think the rate has just about doubled um, in, in the last 30 years. Um, and now we know that about 700 women in the U.S. die every year from pregnancy-related um, complications. Um, what factors are at play here as you've studied this topic? You know, it was really shocking to learn and not to learn until after I became a mother myself that we were in such a terrible state. Um, so when I gave birth in 2003, the United States was ranked 41st um, for maternal health. And, um, and then we fell back further to 46th. And last year, the WHO announced that we had fallen further behind to um, 55th place, um, which is just shocking, especially when um, you consider the fact that the United States um, maternity care is more expensive than it is almost anywhere else on the planet. Um, some of those factors are uh, the fact that, you know, insurance coverage is lacking. Um, not every woman or girl of reproductive age um, has medical um, insurance. Um, we have another problem, which is that um, our system is highly medicalized and so birth is over medicalized. There's an expression which is too little too late or too much too soon. Um, and so, you know, not having the interventions when you need them and also waiting too long and having delays um, can add to complications and ultimately um, death. Um, we have a, a huge um, health disparity problem in this country. Um, as long as I've been advocating on the topic, um, one of the main causes of um, complication or one of the most at risk populations is um, black women. And um, I've heard these statistics since the very beginning and they continue to shock me and I'm sure will shock um, the audience here today. But across the United States, black women are three to four times more likely to suffer or die from a complication related to pregnancy and childbirth. And so um, what has arisen from that, those statistics is that um, Disparities exist in our health system. Implicit bias exists in our health system. And that is um, adding to these numbers um, at a rate which is just, you know, not only unfair, um, it's, it's actually shocking um, and unacceptable. Well, right. And, and there's been, I, I've noticed more attention in recent years paid to this disparity between black mothers and, and white mothers. Um, what are some of the ways that we can work to reduce those disparities, um, whether that's through, um, you know, policies, 
laws, uh, practices of medical professionals, et cetera? Um, well, there's there have been a number of bills introduced um, recently. In fact, um, Representative Underwood, who I know you'll be speaking to soon, um, has introduced an incredible um, omnibus of, um, of bills. And these bills are now addressing the disparities. They're addressing some of the gaps that have existed in our maternity care um, system. And um, I'm hopeful that with leadership like uh, Representative Underwood and the Black Maternal Health Con Ca Caucus, um, as well as, you know, just a number of advocates. Um, and, and I would say in this group of advocates, some of the most powerful voices have been um, people who are sharing firsthand testimonial um, of having lost a partner, a wife, a daughter. Um, and those stories are coming to light and they're finally getting the attention that they deserve. Um, one thing that we hear over and over again from women of color um, is that they're not being listened to in our institutions. Um, they know that something is wrong, they ask for help, and yet they're being um, ignored. And so this is something that we've been advocating very strongly for. Um, I think, uh, you know, hearing the stories, um, we've been a very, our organization, Every Mother Counts, has been very um, focused on storytelling um, along with the data. So the qualitative and quantitative um, data has been really essential in bringing to light these, um, these injustices around maternity care in this country. Um, and so by giving um, space for these stories to be shared, um, by adding those stories to the efforts around um, legislation and, and the bills that need to um, pass in order to get more um, adequate coverage for all women, all childbearing people um, is really essential in, in, in changing these outcomes. I know you mentioned earlier the phrase over-medicalization of mm -hmm. childbirth and wanted to talk for a minute about the C-section rate. That, of course, comes up a lot as a major concern around maternal care. And uh, as I'm sure you know, around one third of all uh, deliveries in the U.S. are through C-section. That's a rate that's much higher um, compared to many other countries. In your opinion, is that rate too high? And if so, what needs to happen? Um, it's absolutely too high. I mean, the WHO, again, um, has given some um, guidance around this. And um, the, the consensus is generally that over 15% is quite high. Um, and so we have some states, as you mentioned, um, that are well over 30%. And um, because C-sections are contributing, a contributing factor to maternal mortality and certainly morbidity, um, it needs to be addressed. Um, we also have a problem in this country around consent. And so um, when you have mothers coming in, um, particularly uh, in institutions where they don't have a lot of choice or options, um, they are oftentimes um, coerced into um, having interventions such as C-sections unnecessarily um, done on them. And that sets them up for, um, for failure down the line. Um, you know, we know that multiple C-sections can um, actually increase your risk to um, complications around pregnancy. And if a woman knew that going in um, or knew that there was an opportunity to um, choose a different option, um, most likely she would. And she would need to be supported in that decision-making process if that were the case. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I've had three kids myself and you sort of know the very vulnerable position you're in when you're having a baby, you want everything to turn out well. Um, and you're, you know, you're listening to what your medical professionals are telling you. But in that situation, how can a woman sort of become an advocate for herself and her baby as she's kind of interacting with health providers in these situations where, you know, consequential decisions need to be made? I mean, it's essential for um, for women to feel empowered enough to be advocates for themselves, but we know that that's not always the case, particularly as you as you say in labor. Um, one way to um, to support a mom through this process is by having a doula. Um, you know, doulas are, are essentially patient advocates, and they really are there to make sure that mom is getting what she needs, that um, the mother or the childbearing person is at the center of her care. Um, and I, I had a doula in um, in both of my deliveries and, um, and it's something that 
um, a lot a lot of people don't know about or realize that they have access to, but it's been proven time and time again, particularly particularly in communities of um, women of color, uh, where you know they may need that extra voice, that extra support to be in the room with them, helping them to um, ask for what they need and also help to understand what is happening to them, especially when um, when things change on a dime. Um, you know, I know in my own case, you know, just having somebody to tell me what was happening at every moment when things escalated um, was really, really important. Um, I think our mental wellness um, through this process in our lives is really, um, it goes underestimated and the value of it is is really important. Uh, when a mother is feeling calm and when she has the support systems around her before, during, and postpartum, um, the outcomes are very different and the experience is drastically different. I know that you're on Governor Cuomo's uh, Maternal Health Task Force. Um, what, are, what are some of the challenges that you're especially seeing women experience during this COVID pandemic as we've seen medical care change, we've seen some hospitals overwhelmed, we've seen a change in how people are, you know, visiting the doctor. Um, what are some particular challenges, um, you know, pregnant and postpartum women are facing in this very strange time? I think, you know, this whole period has been, uh, there's been a lot of confusion. Certainly, um, uh, the information is changing um, daily, if not um, hourly, and con continues to be. I think early on, the stories that we were hearing most were, were stories of fear. Um, women terrified to go to hospitals to deliver there because there, were, there was not adequate um, protective equipment and um, both caregivers and families were at risk. Um, so one of the things that we have advocated for was, you know, because we could sort of listen to the demand that was, um, was becoming elevated, was the fact that there were not enough out of hospital options for delivering safely. Um, we know that birth centers across the country exist and they are very safe options for women to, to choose to deliver. But in New York City, for example, where I live um, and where <laughs> women of color are 12 times at greater risk than a Caucasian woman um, from complications related to pregnancy and childbirth, um, this is a place where we haven't had a birth center in a very long time. So Every Mother Counts actually helped to support um, the standing up of a freestanding birth center in Manhattan, um, and that is now open and, and, um, and, and seeing patients. Um, so I think just, you know, Listening to women is always a good way to start. Um, listening to their fears, which were completely valid. Um, providing information and resources. We also have a, a, a great information resource hub on everymothercounts.org, and there are others out there, um, so that women could start to understand. You know, if they had already, if they were far along in their pregnancy, and it was too late to change sites, um, to understand what the policies in that site were, um, to prepare themselves as best they could. Technology played a, a role and continues to play a role um, today, uh, where you know. We are sort of familiar with the idea of a birth plan, but there was actually um, a lot of recommendations around having a technology plan. So um, making sure that if you were in a hospital during a period of time during COVID where you were not able to have um, a doula by your side or to have a loved one with you, which was the case for many women um, throughout this last few months, that you had to get used to the idea of having that support um, come through a technology device. Um, there's been some interesting changes there too because um, some innovation was really inspired because of that um, that not having the ability to have a person by your side. And so a lot of doulas and midwives sort of worked immediately to work on telemedicine, um, doctors as well, to make sure that moms didn't have to come in for care um, directly if they could ask questions over a screen or by phone. Um, and I think that we're gonna see more of that going forward even beyond COVID. Um, in some respects, it's been, it's been a great way for um, providers and patients to be able to stay connected throughout this time. And we know that um, continuous care throughout pregnancy and childbirth um, and postpartum is essential for keeping moms healthy. Well, and, and kind of along those lines, I remember back in March when 
um, cases were starting to mount. And I remember in some of the hospitals in New York City, out of you know very valid concerns, were originally preventing uh, the husbands or partners of women from coming into the hospitals um, for delivery. And then I think some of the hospitals hospitals had reversed that. Um, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, that can be really, really difficult for women not to have a support system right there with them. Um, do you have any thoughts or recommendations for how hospitals should kind of deal with that question as, you know, they're thinking about keeping the patients there safe, cutting down on infections, but also making sure that women have the support system that they need? I think um, at this point, at least in terms of New York, um, there the safety protocols have been put in place and they have been made more universal. And I think the governor spoke up quite quickly when he learned about women going through this experience on their own. However, at the time when these policies were being implemented, there was not adequate protection for healthcare providers and there was a lot of fear on that end as well. I think by now, um, universal testing at hospitals and birth centers has been required and made more available, um, which is helping for sure. And then following, um, um, safety protocols um, to ensure, you know, that one is as safe as they possibly can be. I mean, it's very, um, when, when, when fear like this happens, it's very difficult to change people's perceptions, um, to prepare them as best you can so that they can, you know, feel safe. Um, you know, we advocate for safe, respectful maternity care. And when you have elements like a pandemic around you, you know, you just can imagine how the increase of fear um, becomes so rampant. And then of course that impacts the, the health and wellness of mom and baby. Um, so yes, I mean, safety protocols having gotten a lot more um, comprehensive and a lot more aligned across the city, but that's been something really important for people who are expecting, um, you know, to really understand what the policies of, of that site are. Hospitals um, are um, oftentimes have different policies and policies are changing, as I said earlier, very frequently. Oftentimes when the state wasn't ready to do it or the city wasn't ready to do it, hospital administrators were, um, were leading the charge. Um, I think again, by now there's a lot more knowledge. Um, they are separating um, families. Remember early on, I think um, it was sort of everyone, all hands on deck. And I think it's it seems to have come back to a place of um, having families separated from other patients. And obviously the surge has, has come down significantly, um, although we know that we're still in it and um, we don't really know what's to come. And so this is a time of preparedness, I think, um, you know, sort of getting people prepared, making sure that staff is prepared and adequ adequately protected for what we don't know um, down the line. So besides um, all the physical components of having a baby, of course, there's the mental health and wellness component. Um, and I, I feel as though the topic of postpartum depression has um, sort of lost a bit of its stigma in recent years, and I've heard more stories of women who feel like they can come out and kind of share their experiences. What do we know about postpartum depression in the U.S., um, you know, how prevalent it is, and do you feel as though it's getting the attention that it should? Um, like you said, I, I think that there has been a destigmatization in the last um, few years. Certainly, um, people know what it is and are talking about it. I think um, there's still a lot that could be done to prepare women um, earlier on in pregnancy um, and then throughout. I mean, we have a huge problem with regard to postpartum care in this country. Um, some legislation that's been introduced is trying to address and extend uh, Medicaid coverage, for example, for up to one year postpartum. I think this would go a long way to ensure that um, women that are experiencing postpartum depression don't fall through the cracks. Um, you know, there are uh, the, the postpartum period, it just kind of, you know, the, the way that our system is and the way that we look at pregnancy in this country, there's such an emphasis on, um, on the baby and on the 24 hours of delivery, but a third or so of the maternal deaths that happen in this country and globally are postpartum. Um, 
And, you know, from the experts that I've spent time with who are focused on postpartum depression, there's so much that we could know early on in the pregnancy that would be an indication for um, who may be um, someone at risk for experiencing postpartum. And then, of course, the experience of the pregnancy and the delivery itself um, can certainly impact the mental health of a mother um, in the postpartum days as well. What are some ways that the the pandemic and the lockdowns and um, just the major disruption to life that we're that we're experiencing? Um, w- what are ways that can be affecting women that are in that postpartum period? Um, are you worried that that's having a kind of a worsening effect uh, or stressful effect on on that whole scene? Well, I've heard a lot about um, the uptick in uh, domestic violence for sure during this period of time. And that's something that I believe um, Governor Cuomo has also um, set up a task force to address. Um, I mean, I think in some instances, you know, with the postpartum period um, previously has been that women feel isolated. I guess that could be a positive um, in this period of time where many people are at home um, and when they're not alone to, and and with this continued um, aspect of care with the telemedicine, I think that there could be more supports in um, in place in some respects. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think this period of time has been, um, it's it's been something that nobody's experienced before. And um, I could see a lot of benefits with the fact of being home longer, right? More people who are working from home or not working at all right now are having an extended period of time if they've delivered during this time um, to be home with their children. Um, But I think the unknowns and the um, not having the financial um, security of a stable, um, you know, employment, it, it can also have a huge impact on um, on one's mental health and, and the wealth, the well-being of the whole family. Um, that's a much harder thing to address right now. Um, but I think, uh, again, having those social, so, psychosocial support systems in place, um, doulas, midwives, providers um, who can continue to give that care, again, beginning uh, throughout and after pregnancy is going to make a huge difference um, in terms of mom. Um, but we need to continue to be thinking about the family and um, making sure that she continues to seek care when she needs it, is asking the right questions at the right time. Um, and um, yeah, getting the support that she needs. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this segment. Christy, thank you so much for joining this mor- joining us this morning. Uh, it's been great talking to you. Please stay tuned, and I'll be back in a few minutes with Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. Good morning. My name is Catherine Lamparopoulos. I'm a pediatric neuroscientist and I'm the director of the Institute for the Developing Brain at Children's National Hospital. I'd like to thank uh, the team at uh, the Washington Post and Christie and Representative Underwood for helping to highlight some of these very important topics. As a scientist and a mother of three, I have seen firsthand how unhealthy environments and particularly high levels of stress during pregnancy can affect a child's development even before birth. We know and our findings certainly support the fact that these are uh, that mother's maternal mental health is so important and it's important not only for the moms but for their babies particularly during the first crucial years of life and potentially their entire lifetime. Simply put, healthy moms equal healthy babies. Uh, What's also important to emphasize and really to build upon the conversation uh, with Christy just before is that 75% 
of mental health problems dur during pregnancy go undetected. So really the critical step is for us to begin to embed universal screening as a must. We also need to develop very important novel interventions and begin to build uh, important social networks for two generations, both moms and babies. We are delighted uh, to announce uh, a recent investment by A. James and Alice B. Clark Foundation uh, that will be funding a citywide initiative uh, that will bring together our obstetricians, uh, our birthing hospitals, and our large uh, local community organization together to begin to develop novel approaches so that we can, uh, that really seek to reduce uh, mental health problems in pregnant women, particularly those that are low income and facing important racial health inequities. Um, we believe that this can happen in DC. We feel that this is a reachable goal and that particularly now is important uh, for this goal to be established as Christy indicated in the wake of COVID-19. We know that uh, there are new and important stressors that are affecting our most vulnerable families. From our end, the way we approach beginning to set up mental health support for pregnant women and children was by going to the women by uh, listening to them, hearing their voices, and beginning to understand uh, their perspectives, listening to their stories, and really um, that really exposed some very staggering uh, racial inequities uh, among women in the district. As we listened to the w these women, they shared some very important issues. First, that language matters, and secondly, Provider trust is so critical, not only from the outset, but that it needs to be maintained throughout their care. One woman shared how when she confided in her uh, caregiver, at the end of her visit, she was met by an ambulance that went and placed her in hospital for a 24 hour hold where she wasn't able to communicate with her family and her children so that they could understand the circumstances. Our goal is really to change this, tra this trajectory, to give women better tools and uh, resources within their community that can help them and their baby. We are truly excited uh, about our uh, new Clark Parent and Child Network. This will really allow us to begin to build an exclusive community of caregivers that will really allow us to meet the needs both on the maternal and the child uh, side of the equations. We believe that this will really be a game changer and that we will really offer the best possible start for every child. Um, well, great, um, and good morning to all of you and thank you so much, Dr. Lombopoulos. Uh, my name is Lee, Dr. Lee Beers. I'm a community pediatrician and the medical director for community health and advocacy at Children's National. Um, I'm also very honored to be the president-elect of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Though perhaps most importantly, I'm a proud resident of Washington, D.C. and the mother of two D.C. public school students. Um, as a pediatrician, I see firsthand how very important the mental health of parents is to the health and development of children. Um, children whose mothers are depressed are more likely to have developmental delays, poor academic achievement, and, and behavior concerns. Um, but as Dr. Mbwapla said, when parents are well, children are better able to thrive, and early identification and treatment makes a difference. Many may not know this, but Children's National is the largest provider of pediatric primary care in DC. And for generations, we've been in the community, engaging families, building trusted relationships and caring for children. We are just so grateful to the A. James and Alex B. Clark Foundation for so generously making Children's National the cornerstone of its investment in maternal and child health programs across DC. The Clark Parent and Child Network is going to, going to create a meaningful bridge from prenatal care to child health and development with a focus on early childhood and parent mental health. We'll be embedding more mental health specialists alongside families trusted pediatricians, expand a dedicated clinic for infant and toddler mental health, and advocate for policies improving access to mental health care so parents don't have to wait to see a specialist when a concern arises. 
However, what I am most excited about and proud of is that the network is going to be grounded in the essential voices of communities and families, really centered through a team of family support specialists who will be embedded in our primary care clinics. Um, you know, these specialists will support families through resource connection and peer support and will be trusted partners in our health system uh, who can further empower families to use their voice, contribute their expertise to the design and implementation of this initiative, and be stronger advocates for their children, their families, and our community. You know, in, in the context of all the challenges with COVID, we know that one thing that is going to, to happen is that our city's existing mental health crisis is going to be worse. It's more vital than ever before that we do everything we do now employs a racial equity lens and respects our community's true vision and needs. With the Clark Foundation's broad support of regional hospitals, community-based care providers, together we can share findings and achieve a collective vision of improved maternal and child health at the community and population level. Children's National is so excited to help build this powerful network in partnership with so many vital local groups. It's a tremendous opportunity to do right by children and families. So thank you again to the Washington Post Live team for giving us this opportunity to highlight the collaborative model we're building here in DC. And we're looking forward now to hearing from Representative Underwood on her national efforts to improve maternal mental health and reduce unexpected, unacceptable disparities. Again, thank you so much to the Clark Foundation for supporting this important work. And please stay with us as we move to the next statement, segment. If you're just now joining us, I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, and I'd like to welcome Representative Lauren Underwood to the program. She's a freshman Democrat from Illinois, the co-founder and co-chair of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, and sponsor of the Momnibus Act of 2020 to address disparities in healthcare between uh, white, white and Black women. Another interesting note about Representative Underwood is she is a registered new nurse, and she also served as a policy advisor to HHS during the Obama administration. Congresswoman, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Hi, Paige, it's good to be with you. Um, I wanna start off talking about disparities because of course this has been top of mind for a lot of people as we've um, thought about racism and, and racial disparities over the last couple of weeks. Um, and as I was looking up some of these stats, um, they kind of, they, they actually blew my mind to, to some of the disparities here. If you look at even college educated black women, they're actually 1.6 times more likely to die um, from pregnancy than a white woman without a high school diploma, um, as you know. And I'm wondering if you can just start off by giving us some thoughts about why that might be, what are the leading causes here? So black women in the United States are between three and four times more likely to die of a pregnancy related cause than white women in our country. In my state of Illinois, black women are six times more likely to die. And that's after you control for factors like education level, income level, whether or not the woman had prenatal care or her insurance status, where she lives geographically. Um, you know, you can control for any number of factors and that disparity persists. What we do know is that there is nothing inherently wrong with the woman. And so it's our country, it's our society, it's the way that black women are treated within our healthcare system. And we know that black women um, often can walk into a, a clinic or a hospital, express that something's wrong or doesn't feel right and not be treated the same way because of implicit and explicit bias. Um, and, you know, there have been many researchers who are studying uh, the disparities, whether it's related to, um, you know, blood pressure causes or infection or mental health. There's individual, uh, you know, 
explicit causes of death, but the key is, is that in this maternal mortality space, this disparity has persisted, and it's been this way for my entire lifetime. I'm 33 years old, uh, and we've not seen, you know, large national initiatives to try to solve this problem, and that's why we started the Black Maternal Health Caucus. Well, and to your point um, about Black women feeling like their concerns aren't taken seriously enough, I know we've heard stories from uh, prominent people, Serena Williams' story is coming to mind, where they were expressing concerns to her provider and they felt like they weren't listened or weren't heard. Um, do you have thoughts about kind of how we can improve that relationship and interaction between the patient and the doctor in those settings? Absolutely. So there's many different things we can do. We can, one, we have to change the culture of our healthcare system. And a one-time webinar or training is not going to do it, right? Uh, this is something where we have to embed in our providers that we need to listen and center that patient's experience. Um, train our providers to recognize their own implicit and explicit biases, right? Implic implicit is, I didn't know that I was treating one patient differently from another. Explicit is racism, right? Let's just make it plain. Um, and then, you know, we need to make sure that we have providers that reflect the diversity of the communities that they serve. We need to make sure that every woman truly has a choice in the kind of provider uh, that she can see, whether it's a gynecologist, an obstetrician, whether it's a midwife, a nurse midwife, or a certified midwife, whether that woman wants a doula to uh, assist with her birth and delivery or not, you know, like that kind of stuff is really important. And it all goes into that woman's experience in our healthcare system. Um, and so, you know, I would say we need to make sure that we are recruiting, training, um, and, you know, ensuring that every community across our country has a diverse set of providers. We need to make sure that these providers are trained to recognize their own biases um, and that there are accountability measures in place uh, for health systems that, you know, don't always um, course correct after there are uh, these kinds of disparities that are seen to persist within their system. So you have this Momnibus uh, Act, which I kind of love the name. Uh, my understanding is it's nine or so uh, pieces of legislation. Um, can you describe some of the ways that, that these, these different pieces are trying to address the overall issue? Yes, so the Momnibus is a suite of legislation. It's comprehensive to fill the gaps that uh, existing legislation had sort of missed. Uh, we've been talking a lot about expanding Medicaid coverage to a full year postpartum, right? Christy talked about it during her segment, and we were so pleased and excited that yesterday, the House of Representatives, for the first time since the Affordable Care Act passed, expanded Medicaid to a full year postpartum. It's huge. What a big accomplishment, but we know that there's other things that need to happen. We need to be investing in this perinatal workforce, uh, uh, solving some of the mental health challenges uh, that women face. And, you know, there's a lot of conversation about postpartum depression, but there's also, you know, anxiety, there's other mental health disorders, there's substance use disorders, and we need to make sure that there's a targeted focused effort on solving uh, those new moms challenges there and giving them the resources to do so. Uh, we have uh, legislation that deals with data collection and gaps in the data collection, incarcerated women. You know, there's women in our federal uh, prison system that are currently being shackled while delivering their babies. And, you know, obviously there are uh, negative outcomes, clinical outcomes associated with that practice. Uh, there are, uh, there's a bill focused on women veterans which is so important, supporting the community-based, community-led organizations that have been doing this work for so long. I mean, when we think about the progress uh, that gets made on a really specific localized level, it's often the community groups that have been doing this work. It's not necessarily driven by a governmental agency uh, or a large federal effort, right? And so we want to make sure that we are supporting those community-based organizations. There's a category in healthcare called social determinants of health nutrition, transportation, housing, right? And we wanna make sure that we are making critical investments in those social determinants as a way to make sure that we are preventing uh, these risk factors for maternal morbidity and mortality before they begin. Uh, again, this is a comprehensive, suite of legislation, uh, digital tools, telehealth, all of that. And so the Momnibus is something that we introduced in March. Uh, Senator Kamala Harris leads the bill in the Senate, uh, and I introduced the Momnibus, the 
suite of bills in the House, but each individual item, each of the nine bills has also been introduced separately. Um, and, you know, so many of my colleagues in the House have been supportive. Many of these bills are bipartisan, and we're excited that they'll be able to get some consideration this year. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question on those lines because, as you know, uh, whenever Congress starts discussing health care policy, it often becomes very, very quickly derailed. Um, and I noticed that you do have some Republicans signed on to some of these measures. Um, but how important was you to was it to you to have bipartisan support? And do you think it, any of these pieces have a realistic chance of becoming law? You know, in the next, I guess, I guess before the election. Yes. So. Let's start out with the caucus. So the caucus was an idea between Congresswoman Alma Adams and I. Uh, she represents a community in North Carolina. We wanted to work on black maternal mortality and uh, we decided to give ourselves a name. Within a year, the caucus grew to over 100 members, bipartisan participation. And so that was the foundation on being able to craft legislation that would have support across the aisle. So for example, that Medicaid expansion that I talked about yesterday, that's the Helping Moms Act that's led by Robin Kelly. It passed unanimously off the Energy and Commerce Committee. I think that that is an item that will uh, be able to get some full consideration in the Senate, uh, certainly Republican support over there and hopefully get signed into law, right? We're talking about state saving moms' lives is critically important. Um, we have a bill to serve women veterans, and I, I introduced that with one of my Republican colleagues on the Veterans Affairs Committee, Mr. Billy Rockus, and you know I'm really excited that he uh, has joined us on this piece of legislation, and I certainly think that this is one that would be you know in good shape to pass out of the House and get over to the Senate and possibly get signed into law this year. Uh, the, I think it's the Moms Matter bill, that's Joe Kennedy's bill, uh, that addresses the mental health challenges uh, that moms in the postpartum period face that has uh, bipartisan support, right? And so we look towards those bills that uh, do have the bipartisan support where the coalition is already being built and we're working it on both sides of the aisle. Obviously, we have about six months left in this uh, Congress. And so there's a long list of legislation that we need to work on. Um, but I'm so pleased that maternal mortality continues to be at the forefront of this healthcare policy agenda where we are able to come together uh, and get things done. And quite frankly, this is an issue that really hadn't risen to, very, uh, to the highest levels of congressional agendas um, in prior Congresses. And so the fact that we're discussing these, this issue, identifying these solutions, and identifying vehicles to attach these bills into is something that uh, really gives me hope. You mentioned the idea of the social determinants of health. So uh, for the audience, when we're talking about that, we're talking about all of the aspects around somebody that can affect their health. So housing, access to transportation, access to good nutrition. And I know there's been more discussion around that, especially in the space of Medicaid in recent years. And how do you kind of equip the program to try to um, provide those aspects or improve those aspects of people's lives instead of only focusing on medical care. Um, do you see the Medicaid program moving in that direction at all? Um, and, you know, do, do you, ha you know, what kind of an effect do the social determinants have on the development of young children? Yes. So it's really important that uh, for the states that did expand Medicaid, that they take a look at their programs and explore some of the waivers uh, that would allow them to um, expand uh, their coverage opportunities and address some of these social determinants of health. There's real opportunities uh, to be creative. And I've had the opportunity, for example, to talk to some of the Medicaid managed care providers and encourage them uh, to think about ways that they can leverage um, their unique structure. Uh, to do innovative uh, things to improve the health status of the women that they serve. And we know that addressing these social determinants, whether it's connecting women uh, with nutritionists or dietitians for a visit to, to do some nutrition counseling, identify, you know, sources of, you know, good nutritious foods within their communities, things like that is incredibly important. Uh, we know that housing instability, transportation, you know, pollution, all these other social determinants of health um, certainly impact the mother's health and well-being, but also that child's, right? This is a key driver in health disparities uh, throughout, you know, 
our communities, not just limited to pregnant women and postpartum women. Um, and so this is a conversation that has long dominated uh, what we talk about in public health circles uh, for strategies to solve health disparities across the board, whether it's cardiovascular, cancer, uh, or maternal mortality. It's, it's critically important. Well, and of course, we've been talking a lot about mothers, but we know that fathers also play a huge impact uh, in, in the development of young children. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, about their role and whether that has an, can have an impact on um, maternal health and um, the prenatal period as well? Oh, certainly, right? Women need to have strong and supportive partners throughout from preconception to the postpartum period, right? It's critically important. Uh, and yet this legislation is specifically focused on the unique challenges that uh, the moms face because in our healthcare system, right? Think about COVID-19. And one of the things that emerged during COVID is that some women were having to deliver alone. And so if a woman is alone in the hospital or in her birthing center uh, for that delivery, that means sometimes that she is missing that advocate. And if something goes wrong, right, that she might be missing that critical individual who can uh, speak to the provider team, can, you know, plead for help. I think of uh, my friend Charles Johnson, his uh, wife Kira died after delivering um, their son. Uh, Langston and you know we have a bill named after Kira and the Momnibus and as he tells his story he talks about um, so so passionately and it, it's just you know heartbreaking the way that he was with her at every step of the way following up with the medical team continuing to ask them to perform the tests and to prioritize the care that his wife needed and in their in their story, right, that healthcare system chose not to do that. Um, and so I think that the role of a father or a partner, it doesn't have to be the genetic father to the child. It could be, you know, a mom, a close friend. The doulas are so important, right, for for doing that advocacy work in addition to supporting the mom during the delivery. And um, we need to make sure that uh, those folks are equipped, they are informed, and they're feeling empowered within in the context of that larger healthcare system uh, to support the mom during every stage, preconception to postpartum. You recently wrote a piece in Essence Magazine about your own experience of losing a friend due to pregnancy complications. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and how that inspired you to act? Yes, my friend from graduate school, uh, Dr. Shalon Irving, uh, was a brilliant, beautiful, excited, expectant mom to be. She um, had a PhD in sociology and gerontology. She was working at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta as a Lieutenant Commander in the US Public Health Service Commission Corps. She had dedicated her career to ending health disparities. So she is a highly educated expert who did everything right, everything right. She gave birth to her beautiful baby girl, Soleil, in January of 2017. And three weeks later, she died due to complications from her pregnancy. And when I tell you that I was stunned and shocked, I mean, listen, I'm a nurse. We know the statistics about Black women dying. We know what the disparity looks like. Uh, but to, to see that happen to my friend, someone who um, knew the risks, and um, again, had done everything right, was just devastating. And so I knew that when I won this uh, election for Congress that I wanted to work on this issue. Um, and I knew that there would be such a rich opportunity to make a difference. Um, and what I did not expect, I have to tell you, is that we would find so many people that were interested in working with us, whether it's you know the Trump administration and the Surgeon General. Uh, whether it's firms like Uber and Lyft who want to talk about creative solutions to bringing to you know solve this transportation issue, speaking to the social determinants that we talked about before, whether it's you know provide uh, providers and large payers, right? Like these insurance companies, um, so many recognize the systemic nature of this problem, the maternal mortality crisis that we face, and they are interested in working together. So the idea of reaching across the aisle on Capitol Hill is important, but extending that universe of action is also critically important. I think that this is such a wonderful way to honor the life of my friend, Shalon, 
um, is to make sure that in our country, this doesn't happen again. Um, and I think that, you know, we have uh, a long ways to go, but I'm so encouraged by the progress. You also had mentioned that elements of your Momnibus uh, package address women veterans and women who are incarcerated. Can you talk a little bit about more about those two groups? Yes. So, you know, those two groups were key for us to address with the Momnibus because, uh, you know, when we think about the federal government and the way that we directly provide care, you know, the VA, Veterans Affairs, uh, is, you know, a large federally run healthcare system. And we know that women veterans are the fastest growing segment of our veterans population. And so on our VA committee, we have been, uh, the House Veterans Affairs Committee, we've been working a lot to improve the quality of care that women receive within the VA system. You know, the VA right now, even in their mission statement, it talks about serving men. And so when we have these women across the lifespan, right, you know, newly, um, like really young women who are, you know, in their early 20s that become veterans and eligible for care. And then we have women in the cadet nurse corps from World War II that are still alive and getting care at the VA. We have a lot of work and opportunity to, to, to improve the care that they're receiving. So the maternal health portion of the VA care is critically important and often overlooked. Um, and so this was an opportunity to make sure that we're not seeing disparities persist make sure that they're getting culturally appropriate care um, and that there's like a seamlessness. Um, because oftentimes, right, if a woman happens to deliver in a VA facility, that child is not getting the care at the VA, right? So sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect um, and you know we want to solve some of those barriers. With respect to incarcerated women, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, right, um, you know, takes care of a lot of pregnant women. And we know that there is a real need to ensure that it's not perpetuating these disparities. Uh, there are, you know, I would say practices that would never, ever, 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 ever be acceptable um, in our community care environment that are happening in our prisons. And it's wrong. Women are experiencing extreme trauma and women are dying. And um, this is one of these circumstances where we say not on our watch. And so the incarcerated women's bill is being led by my friend Ayanna Presley. And, um, you know, it's an important measure that we need to get enacted into law. Wanted to ask you a question about the COVID pandemic. Um, I know that I have a few friends that are pregnant and were telling me that, you know, they hadn't actually been to the doctor the way they normally would have. I had a friend who wasn't actually able to make it in until her 20 week ultrasound. Um, mm -hmm. And of course she had virtual check-ins with her doctors, um, but are you concerned that maternity care is suffering at all um, during the pandemic? Yes, you know, I have spoken to providers that told me, for example, that they wanted to shift so many of their expectant moms to these virtual visits, uh, but everybody couldn't afford a blood pressure cuff. And if you haven't been diagnosed with preeclampsia, then, you know, oftentimes insurers will not pay for that blood pressure cuff because there's no clinical need, right? But what we want to do is prevent someone from getting uh, pregnancy-related high blood pressure uh, because we know that that is such a key um, risk factor to, you know, maternal morbidity and mortality, right? And so there are challenges in this COVID-19 space with transitioning to telehealth, with making sure that women are getting that kind of support that they need, and quite frankly, recognizing that that televisit, that telehealth exchange is not necessarily the evidence-based intervention that uh, we can count on to save mom's lives during this critical period. And so again, I pride myself on being a data-driven, evidence-based policymaker. Um, I like to, you know, consult with the biomedical research and evidence, talk with my nursing colleagues and our physician colleagues to make sure that the, um, and community groups, obviously, that the legislation that we're putting forward has its roots in, uh, in the evidence that would, that would work to save mom's lives. And I think in this COVID era, we need to make sure that everything that we're doing is not 
um, just for convenience, uh, but that there is a clinical effectiveness that goes along with it. Um, and I think that there's some work still to be done um, in that telehealth space. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank Congresswoman Underwood and Christy Turlington Burns for being with us. It was wonderful hearing, hearing your thoughts and perspective. We have some great interviews coming up, including with Kumail Nanjiani and Emily V. Gordon this afternoon, and tomorrow, Mary Daly, who's president of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And you can access those interviews by going to WashingtonPostLive.com for all of the details. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham. Thanks for watching.